Welcome back to Eschatology Matters. Um, Eschatology Matters, I want to mention, is now part of the Fight, Laugh, Feast network. So you can still find our content everywhere that it is uh, it is currently hosted and published. You can check us out at eschatologymatters.org. But you can also hopefully find us soon on the uh, Pub TV app and wherever uh, FLF has their, has their content hosted. Um, today we're jumping into a, a sort of uh, new series. Uh, we have a couple of interviews lined up. We do a lot of eschatology-related uh, content on Eschatology Matters. We do some deep dives. We do some interviews. Um, we've done some debates on Eschatology Matters. But the design for this series is hopefully addressing something very practical, very eminently uh, practical for the Christian. Um, we're looking at practical implications of eschatology, what our eschatology leads to. One of the things we've tried to advocate for at Eschatology Matters is that our eschatology should actually bear fruit. It should actually lead to a different way of living for the Christian and not just be something of, of academic interest. So in this series, we want to look at establishing Christian communities and what that might look like. So our first guest on this series is uh, Michael Foster. So Michael, thank you so much for joining me today, brother. Yeah, it's great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Michael, if, if you wouldn't mind, just give a little brief introduction. Um, you pastor at East River Church um, across the border there in Ohio. You've written um, several things, but I, I think most people would probably know you from It's Good to Be a Man um, and, and the related content. But a little, little introduction of where people can keep up with you. Sure. I'm most active on uh, Twitter and Instagram. So this is Foster on Twitter, and we made people on Instagram. Uh, I'm a pastor, bivocational pastor. So I work as a sales director and also uh, senior pastor of East River Church. Uh, I'm married, been married a little over 20 years. Em and I have uh, seven kids out of the womb, one in heaven and one in the womb due at the end of next month. So we've nine, nine kids together. We live out here in Batavia, Ohio, which is just outside of Cincinnati. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations on the, uh, on the one in the Thank oven. You. That's great. Yeah. So, so being down in Cincinnati, so I, I grew up in Chardon, which is outside of Cleveland up on, on the coast. So Cincinnati was sort of, you know, I think there was a little rivalry there, but are you an Ohio state fan? And I ask because I'm in Michigan, this, this matters deeply to me. I don't really follow sports almost at all. anymore if it's not boxing, uh, but I generally root for whoever's closest to Cincinnati, like the Bearcats or whoever. Ah, okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, we, we we can get on board with Cincinnati as long as it wasn't a Ohio State Michigan thing. Um, but no, Michael, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you specifically is um, a, lo a lot of the stuff that you have done. It seems to it, it seems to just address where people are. I think that's why it resonated, especially like the it's good to be a man stuff. It was it was stuff that people could connect to. Um, one of one of my fears with with addressing stuff like eschatology or any of these things is that it becomes sort of a sort of a pie in the sky academic. It becomes something we know and not something we do. Um, and I think a lot of your work has really kind of connected those things. So I was I was hoping to walk through, and, and we were talking just briefly before I started recording, but I'm not looking for technical, and we're not really working through technical definitions so much as I, w I would like to get an understanding for what a Christian community looks like, what, what it looks like to build, intentionally build Christian communities, um, those sort of guardrails. But before we get into some of the, the X's and O's, what, what what can we think of when we think of Christian community in general? What what do we what do we mean when we when we speak of those? Are you as a pastor, you as as a practitioner of, of your Christian faith, how would you start to define a Christian community to somebody who's unfamiliar with the term? Well, I don't know that it has a specific technical definition. What I would say is a community is this a group of people have something in common right so we can talk about the online reformed community the the claremont county community so when we're talking about a christian community we're talking about a community that shares some sort of christian characteristic usually that could be uh believers so we're thinking about the church but you can have like say a christian bookstore bookstore is not living it's a store right so when we say it's a christian bookstore we say that it, the content that it sells is generally christian the way it's ran is generally christian in so much so that it aligns up with christian ethics and topics and things like that so sometimes people will have a uh, issue this christian nationalism debate that's kind of been a big thing online the last couple of years 
has been, well, a nation can't be Christian. A nation's not people. Well, a nation doesn't have an individual soul. No one's disagreeing with that. I, I, at least I'm not. But so Christian can be specifically being a born again believer, right? Mm -hmm. um, belonging to a local church, or we could be using Christian in a more broad way just to say the characteristics of this community are more in line with the ethics of scripture, with what the Bible teaches. So when we're talking about making a Christian community, it could be we're planting churches and we want churches to be biblical. It could be that as uh, a, Christ a Christian citizenship grows at a particular county, region, country, state, whatever, that we are hoping as salt and light to see that geographical location um, in its uh, culture, you know, its arts, its its commerce, its uh, the way it's governed to take on a uh, Christian characteristic to be more in line with scripture. So I think both uh, that's what people mean in general when they're talking about it, but you kind of got to see which angle they're looking at it. And um, so for us, when we talk about a Christian community, um, we would be talking about the influence that we as uh, believers uh, united in local fellowships bring to bear in the time and place God's put us. So I always tell people, uh, I'm a biblical localist, if I had to put like a sort of title to it. And uh, by being a biblical localist, all I mean is that I give priority to the time and place God put me, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> so I'm here in Claremont County. I'm here in Batavia right now in, in my office, uh, which is the county seat of Claremont County. I, I live here. Um, I work here. Uh, I, I don't I don't leave my county. I, it's kind of weird. I'm either in Claremont County or hundreds or thousands of miles away. I'm kind of one or the other. Um, but this is where God's put me. This is where what matters most to me. These are my neighbors. Um, this is where my family is. This is where my church community is. And I can affect a lot of change here like I, that I can see with my own eyes where at, when you start getting at a state regional and certainly national level, it's not that you don't have effect, but, but you just can't really see it. And it, and this is like, you, you're talking about this a little bit with eschatology, even when you, you guys are post millennialist, right? That's what this is. I mean, it's not, it's not exclusively so, but most of our guys are post millennialist. Yeah. <clears throat> Problem with eschatology, but even post millennialism is the scale that it occurs at. Right. It's like through uh, not months or, or years, but decades, century and potentially even millennia. Right. Mm -hmm. That the, the sort of kingdom of God is expanding and reaching all and affecting the entire globe. It's happening over a long periods of time. Right. So we we all believe those of us that are of a post millennialist uh, perspective would see the kingdom of God spreading over the entire earth. But it happens over a long period of time in kind of herky jerky, like so in investments, I used to be a card counter and in card counting, you, you'll eventually win, but you have what's called variance. So there's EV expected value that a particular game will generate over a certain number of hands and um, AV actual value. So when you look at a stock, you see it going up and down, up and down. But if you chart a line through it, it goes up, right? Mm. So that's what post millennialists believe about the um, the ground that the kingdom's gaining. It's that it's herky jerky. It's not the steady sort of line. But if you chart it throughout history, we are gaining ground. Right. So the problem with that though is here we are. We we're we have short lives if we if we're really healthy we we might make it to 100 but most of us are going to die in our 70s and 80s and so thinking a thousand years is good in one way when you're trying to understand the trends of history and doctrines and things like that but when it comes to actually doing something you have to shrink the scale down and so i like to keep things at a very local level uh, i had a conference that we did for three years called county before country and that is my general mindset is that um i don't really keep up with the news um i don't care about ukraine or, or russia or any of that stuff and I really don't even care about the election i'll show up and i'll vote i'll vote straight republican and i'll go back home and who knows if it does anything or not when it comes to national elections but what i really care about is you know um mayors commissioners care about local um politics i care about the local economy 
Um, I care about what's going on in our local schools. I care about uh, building relationships with other other churches here. And I really, I I, I think um, a lot of times we talk about things that we can't do anything about mm -hmm. because we can get all uh, we can say if I were king for a day, here's what I would do, right? But you are king over something. If you're a little kid, you're king over your room. Clean it up. Take dominion, right? If you if you're a husband or a wife, you have your house that you're over, that you're taking care of. There are things that you have rule and reign over. And so everyone will talk about this is what the what things should look like at a national level. But what, what should things look like at a local level? Even if it starts with your bedroom and your house or your uh, your vocation, what are you doing there? I like to start there because I think um, – if we all, if we had churches that are more committed to that, we would build up a Christian base that could affect things at a larger scale, uh, uh, larger scale and much quicker. So that's, I think that's how we have to start about where has God put you? When has God put you? I wasn't meant to live in the 1600s or the 1800s. I was meant to live in the 2000s, right? In the 80s, 90s, and 2000s this is where God wants me in 2024 doing what I'm doing. He wants me right here in Ohio and Batavia. That's where God has uh, brought me, and I want to give the priority priority to that. So I'm willing to go out of town. Like I've gone to Australia for two weeks to do stuff, but um, lately I've just been saying no to all conferences if, if I can't drive there. And just working here. And I would just say, Christians, do you know your neighbor? Do you know your mayor? Do you know even what system of government your county has? Do you know who your sheriff is? He's one of the most powerful people in, in your county. Mm. And um, <clears throat> what's if you're a pastor, what's your relationship with the other local churches? Like we have some major disagreements out here. But for the most part, East River has really positive relationships with all the churches around this way because – we, you know, if they if they're teaching, if they're within the pale of orthodoxy, uh, they're certainly partners in the gospel, and we don't want to be at odds. So, what what are, what is going on where God has you? That's the question you need to start to ask. So, that's the mindset I would start with. Okay, yeah, no, that's. I, I think that should be like a a nice balm for everybody during an election season is that um, you focus on where you are and, and don't try to change the world. Um, like you said, vote, you know, be, be involved, but don't, don't try to, I think, I think that is where a lot of people get into a panic attack is, is, is trying to grapple with these, these forces that are quite simply out of our control. They're not outside of God's control, but they're just not under our immediate, you know, sphere of influence. But what, one of the things, Michael, you said that I, that I'm, I'm just thinking through, I'm thinking through really kind of the cultural engagement aspect um, you'd, you'd mentioned, um, that things can be Christian. They don't have to have a soul, which I agree with you. They don't have to have a soul for us to, to speak of something as being a Christian, you know, fill in the blank that Christian can be an adjective and not just a noun. I know that's, that's sort of a debate, but we'll, we'll not engage that. Um, but so if, if things can be Christian, I wonder to what extent, um, cause we're going to get into kind of how to address this as individuals or as a church, but, but if you're trying to encourage Christian communities, I would like to see a Christian community in Batavia. I would like to see a Christian community in whatever town, like you said, God has placed you in and the time God's placed you in. Um, to what extent should we be looking at cultural engagement? Um, and again, I know most of these terms are kind of loaded, right? It depends on what you mean by culture and what you're talking about there. A lot of, a lot of back and forth, but just in general, you've referred to things like the arts, the schools, like there, there's things out there beyond just the church, right? Um, to what extent should Christians be looking around at their local elections, their local policies, their local school boards or uh, social systems, whatever makes up that culture? How, how, how much of a role does that play in the view of a Christian who's just wanting to build faithfully a Christian community where they are? It's going to really differ on the person, right? Um, so I'm actively involved in economics. I, I, go, I go to the Chamber of Commerce meetings. I um, meet with other business leaders. I've had uh, people for Ohio jobs come here and, and look over our office and the shop that we've built out here in Batavia for the transformer company I work for. Um, so I'm, I'm deeply involved in the economics. Um, I, I care about, we have the Perina factory coming in. I track uh, how many jobs they're bringing. I track uh, what, how much, like right now, uh, what it's an acre of commercial lands going for, how many there's across the way, there's a bunch of uh, housing developments <clears throat> and whether or not they're selling. And I'm concerned about how many uh, acres uh, we're going to require uh, for these new lots. If it's going to be like a quarter acre, half acre, it shapes the whole thing. Like I'm, I'm really into all of that. Um, 
but I have a vested interest as as a director involved in a growing business and uh, and, and very concerned about my uh, labor force having uh, places that they can live, right? And 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 a growing labor force to supply uh, our needs. Uh, but not everyone's like living that way. Like my wife, she's she's a, a keeper of the home, and she we she educates our kids. But she she knows more that's going on in some places than I do. She's like deeply involved in piano lessons and gymnastics, and you meet parents there, and she's gathering with different moms and knows whether this park is a good park or not a good park. And I get informed on that sort of stuff and what I need to know. So part of it is to start and look around, like where can you get involved? You know, Thomas Massey is a Senator and he's got a documentary. I forget, but if you just Google Thomas Massey documentary, but it tells how he got involved in uh, local politics. And it was because there were some stupid zoning laws and he just showed up to a committee meeting and he was well-spoken. So people kept giving him uh, their five minutes so he could talk. And one thing led to another and that's how he ended up getting involved in national politics. I think just start where you're at uh, because uh, God has called us to be a godly influence wherever we're at. And so for me, it's uh, as a pastor and, and as a, a business leader, how I do it for my wife, it's uh, as a um, mother, a keeper of the home, a, a servant to our local church, just as a Titus II woman, uh, where has God given you some influence? Develop that. That's where I would start. It matters for all of us. We, we have to uh, obey God in the whole of life, and we have to... Um, seek to use every opportunity, every gift he's given us for his glory and the good in particular of the church. But also just you can look with Israel in Babylon in like Jeremiah 29, that their God's chosen people, the covenant people should also by their productivity and holiness be a blessing to their local community. And so I, and I think that has been the case with East river, for example, when we have our County before country, um, uh, conferences, I, I only use local restaurants to uh, cater. Right. So, uh, the, and, and I'll, I'll tell them, Hey, we got, there's going to be several hundred people coming into town. You might want to have your food ready. You might want to have a special menu for people to do quick orders and whatever. And, and then we'll direct everyone there. I let the uh, the local hotel right here in Batavia know what's going on, and try to build a really positive relationship with them because I want the I want good businesses to do well, and I want them also to see how committed we are to to this uh, town and this county. And it's it's been we've had some really awesome things happen. You know, we we our mayors visited our church. The the um, deputy sheriff's been to our church. Um, and uh, and so those are the things that how I kind of approach it. I don't know if that answers the question, but I hope it does. No, yeah, it it, it does. And I'm thinking through. I, I guess there's like there's kind of two dynamics that I'm thinking of. It, it, one of them is just like what is the what is the role of the church? Because um, I I know that some would grapple with like what, what is the role of the individual versus the role of the church? Like should the church itself, you know, as the church, should it be concerned with? Christian culture, you know, I, I think that most people would be comfortable with talking about Christians doing Christianly things, right? Like we we live as Christians. There's a positive influence, but what would be the role then of the corporate body? And this this probably kind of kind of pairs or dovetails with the, with that concern is to what extent is it, um, in, in essence, to what to what extent is it the the task or the concern of the Christian to intentionally build Christian culture. So, you know, you were mentioning, you know, doing Christianly things, you're, you're having a positive influence because you are a Christian living as a Christian, right? Like that, that should naturally have a positive effect. But um, I, I know that there's been a lot of pushback specifically in recent uh, months slash years with, with a lot of the Christian nationalism debate and things of that nature. Um, there's been a lot of pushback about Christians should just commit themselves to evangelism. We should just commit ourselves to, you know, whatever you define that as the Great Commission, the the evangel uh, evangelization of the world, and that to involve ourselves with other things is like it's almost like muddying the waters a bit. Like, how, how do we? How do we that that whole conversation here? is stupid. It's just <laughs> juvenile and ignorant. Like, what does that even mean? Like, I, I go, I shop 
at my local stores. I get my food there. I get my hair cut locally. I have neighbors I live next to. Sometimes my chickens get on their property. I got to talk. I got to talk to them. You know, we've got we've got tax levies that we all have to decide whether or not we want to pay. Uh, the answer on tax levies is always no. But <laughs> we've got we um we we all live in like we don't live in bubbles. There's no way not to engage, to be affected by your local uh, um, culture. And you're either engaging by by kind of um, avoidance, which is a sort of sin of omission, um, uh, or or you're or you get involved purposely. But we're all involved, like in one way or another. If you go to a gym, you're involved. Mm. Like you know, if your kids go to like my kids, like I said, are in gymnastics. My son's on the wrestling team here. My kids are homeschooled, but my my older son is on the local public school wrestling team, which you can do out here. And you get you end up getting invested in caring about people and caring about things. That's those are arguments that frauds and posers have online that aren't doing anything because it makes it doesn't even make any sense. Like. Oh, we're, we're not involved in our culture. How? Like 1 Corinthians 5 says that we're uh, – Paul's saying like, look, I, I w didn't tell you that you're not supposed to hang out with fornicators and covetous of this world because you'd have to go outside of this world. Uh, it's anyone that names himself as a brother and won't repent. You expel them, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the one of the points there is like how will you not interact with these people? Like what? So when I hear all that, I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, I don't, I, I don't, none of this makes sense to me. It seems stupid. It seems like a tempest in a teapot and I'm not going to treat it like it's a, a intellectual. It's not, it's hilarious. The more intellectual um, a conversation gets, the more likely it's retarded, right? That is the absolute fact in this day and age. Like the, like people that are smart generally don't have to throw a bunch of isms and long words around. The moment someone starts throwing big words around all the time, red flags should go up. That's not how someone who's mastered a topic talks about it. People mm -hmm. who have mastered a topic are really good at communicating uh, to normal to normal folks. But a lot of these guys aren't trying to communicate to normal folks. They're trying to impress each other. And I'll tell you, like, uh, it, we can't just be hearers of the word. We have to be doers of the word. Like, the, we don't just come in word, but power right we actually affect the world if someone sees his brother in need and says go and be warm right what good has he done you tell me you have faith and i have works i'll show you my faith by my works scripture teaches us to have action activity to be involved in the world around us um so i don't see any way for anyone whether they're christian or not not to be participating in the creation of culture in one way or another yeah. It's just it's a byproduct of human interaction, of making things, of of being part of God's creation. Now, that being said, when it comes to the church, I'm a word and sacrament guy. Uh, our church doesn't try to create a ministry and and uh, for every little niche you can think of. That's uh, I, we believe that the purpose of the church is to preach the word of God, to minister the sacraments and to rightly administer church discipline. That's how we equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So we gather on the Lord's day for worship. Uh, we are, uh, we, we confess our sins. We worship God. We're fed through the word and the, in the visible word that is the sacrament. And then through the benediction, we're sent out into power and we go out to our various stations and um, uh, in life and occupations and vocation, all that stuff. And then as salt and light, <clears throat> we start to affect change everywhere. And that's the, so the job of the church is to boldly teach the word of God and apply it to the people in front of you. So at our church, we say one of our commitments is that we speak to the issues of the day. But since we go through scripture passage by passage, uh, we speak to those issues as they come up. And God is so faithful to bring them up. So we'll talk about transgenderism. We'll talk about government overreach. But we're not going to do long topical series where they become weird hobby horses because people need to know the entirety of the word of God. So what I would say, my view on the church is that the church should just be preaching the Bible and as it touches on the issues that uh, that are that we're especially facing now, you bring them up. 
And those issues are right there in scripture. You know, like if you find a book in the Bible that's not that doesn't have some sort of sexual uh, chaos, sexual sin, or corruption dealt with in it. There, it's all there. Try to find a book in the Bible that's not talking about abdication or overreach of authority. Again, it, they're all there. Uh, so the church pastors, we need pastors to be. Uh, boldly teaching God's word and explaining it so those the people in front of them in those seats can understand it. That's what I would say. And then what you do is you encourage people. Like we ha we have people that, um, for example, ask uh, us. Our church doesn't have an abortion ministry, and I'm not sorry about that. Um, we're we're out here in Claremont County. We don't have an abortion clinic, thank God, and we're going to keep it that way. Now there is one over in Hamilton County. And uh, so what we do is that we have some people that go out there. We let people know they're going out there and we, we, we give them the money to buy signs. We help them design better signs. Uh, we, we'll do that. Uh, but it, that's, that's us equipping those people to go out there and get involved. And we encourage people to get involved in local government, but it's not an East River ministry. It's us equipping the people in our church to be salt and light in all these various opportunities. That's how we look at it. Oh, okay. No, that, that, you you, you kind of answered my next question too because because I was thinking number one I totally agree with you as far as the isms go um it's 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 real possible myself included like I did you know I I've been to seminary and everything it, it's it's easy to get those really compelling sounding sentences together that don't actually say we you know my wife and I always talk about like you know fourth grade third graders if you can explain it to your kid like that's when I know and when I'm trying to explain something to my kid and I cannot get words out of my mouth I realize like I have not wrapped my head around this. Um, so I really resonate with that. But um, but no, thinking to the church, because one of the things I was going to ask, and I think you've kind of halfway answered it already, was just I think I think a lot of times for some Christians who are who are genuinely wanting to see uh transformative Christian living in their community, they get worried about distractions within the church. But I think typically it's with those things that you were just addressing, where you have any number of ministries addressing any number of topics and um, and ways of engaging the community that sort of distract from the main focus of the church to where the, the church almost com becomes like a, you know, like a PAC or a political arm or, or an action committee. Um, so that, that that's an entry. Are there any other like in your mind, because you're talking about guardrails here, are there any other guardrails that you can think of for the church as the church? Because um, you're thinking of Christians engaging with the culture. I can see that. I can see you saying, hey, I'm a businessman. I need to be a Christian influence with my local business uh, council, whatever that looks like. But for the church, if you're keeping those things sort of centralized, word and sacrament, the church discipline, as you added on, any other guardrails you can think of just from a pastoral church well, standpoint? Yeah, there's a bunch. Like I tell people, our church is not the YMCA. Like we we don't we don't we're not a purveyor of goods and services. We're not here to like, hey, when's your yoga class? When's this? When's this? Like like you have to have a class for everybody. Uh, it's not the job of the church to replace the parents, right? So we we're there to equip the parents, and we supplementally help. With their youth, we have a youth gathering that meets once a month, and and the parents are allowed to stay, you know, and and it's not taught by some twenty year old, twenty two year old with a goatee, and that's really good at Call of Duty or something. It's taught by me or one of the other elders, mm -hmm. and so we supplement and help them, but we're not here to replace, to give you, to meet every little niche you want. Um, we're not. Uh, I'm not a paparazzi rag. I'm not here. You know, I'm, I'm willing to name names if I need to, but I don't keep up with all the Christian controversies because I'm a man. I'm a grown man. Like I have stuff to do, right? This stuff, this stuff is here one day and gone the next. It's a, it's like if it's a 24 hour news cycle. If it's more like 12 or six hours. So we, we, I'm not, I'm not up in. Um, I don't talk. Actually, I tell my pastors if I talk about social media too much, will you, will you give me a hard time? Because most of my people don't track my social media. They don't care. And most people don't know all the stuff that's – it's a it's a tempest in a teapot. And so if I'm up there talking about this guy and that guy and this controversy and that controversy, you you move from being a preacher of the word, apply it to your people, to being something more like a, like a paparazzi rag. You know, I'm not into that. I think discernment ministries can turn into that. Um, right. so, so there's all these different ways a church can go off, but man, if you, if you meet and you have a, a, a liturgy, that's something representative of what we've seen in history, right? There's a lot of different ways to do it. Our church roughly falls a Geneva liturgy, but you wouldn't even know it because we're not like, we have a Geneva liturgy. Look how reformed we are. You know, we don't, we don't let people, we don't make the big deal, but we have, if you have a liturgy and you preach the word of God, 
like passage by passage, it's kind of hard to go wrong. People are hungry for the word of God. And then there's just things that present themselves as you go through it. Like, for example, this is crazy. Um, I never preach on cremation, but I, I was going through Amos and there's an, and there's a passage in there that talks about why it would be wrong to even take your enemy's bones and burn them down to, to ash, right? So I decide last minute, that I'm going to preach on cremation as part of my sermon. That was the day the mayor came to our, uh, to our church and he is a funeral director. Oh, wow. And he, and then I had talked about like why I'm against cremation, but why, why it's popular and why sometimes you find yourself backed into it, even if you don't want to do it. And, and after the service we talked, he's like, yeah, you're, you're hundred percent right on that. And I prefer burial, but yeah, like I didn't plan that. It's just, there it is. People like people don't bury, we don't have funerals anymore. We have celebrations of life because people don't actually just grieve and move on with it. And so God presents you these issues and you just got to be faithful and you say, Oh yeah, this would be helpful to address what a lot of people deal with. And as a pastor, you, you know, what's going on with people. And so God gives you the, if you start doing that, you're going to change your whole community. You, you really are. Um, it, it just preach the word and, and help apply it to people's life, you know, to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. So those are my guard rails anyway. No, and that's so I, we 75, 25, 75 percent expositional, right? So we're in uh, First John right now. I did Amos before that. So we go New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament. Uh, and then we do one or two short topical series a year uh, that we address like some particular issue we think needs to be talked about or whatever right. and that's that's been really helpful and then uh we've got lawyers we we talk to guys about their jobs we have a men's meeting a women's meeting a youth meeting so at the men's meeting we talk about men's stuff uh stuff that guys are dealing with at the the women's meeting the titus two women teach the women in our church and it really is titus two stuff it's not like theology it, like proper but it's like the issues that women are dealing with so in that we're trying to equip you know guys are going to talk a lot about their careers and vocation. Um, and, and, and so you end up giving them lots of principles. Like the last teaching I did was from Mary and Martha and it was on uh, maintaining proper margins and working from a restful rigor. It's like, here's how you don't kill yourself. Right. But also be productive. And here's how you budget your time and how you get involved and, and that sort of stuff. So I think a church can speak to these issues without being, I, I don't want to be a social gospel. Right. right. So we've seen a liberal social gospel, but right. there can be a conservative social gospel. Absolutely. And um, I, I got to be careful. I say this recently, I talked to a politician who was speaking at a conference that I had been at. And when I asked that, that politician whether or not they attended church, well, I, no, I didn't ask if they did. I said, what church do you attend? They got all weird, right? They're like, well, you know, these churches don't preach enough. Like, sir, going off this thing. I'm like, why can't you just say the name of the church? Why are you like, what's this weird deal? And, and my conclusion is he doesn't go to church, right? Mm. And there is such thing as Christless conservatism. Like that's real. That's not the biggest enemy of the day, but it is an enemy. It's out there. Right. right. So like, I think reformed world has taught plenty on Sola. Um, well, on justification by faith. I don't know that that's the main fight of the day. I think the fight of the day is more tied to ecclesiology and anthropology, but it's still an area that we have to be strong on. And so I, I we need to watch out for social, um, gospel that uh, takes the form of uh, uh, kind of appealing to conservative impulses. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, I, I, I wonder, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, you mentioned sort of the, the threats of our day um, and we can, well, you know, you can look around today and see a social um, quote unquote gospel that does not seem to have much gospel. You could certainly look to that like, you know, 19th century type stuff, but just looking to today, again, just tracking with the, the seeming trajectory of Western culture, um, you know, Aaron Wren, we, we had him on the channel and of course he's been everywhere talking about, you know, sort of negative world conception. Um, and I, I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that 
things are not darker than they've ever been. Like we, 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 I think every generation has that impetus to like, th this is the worst the world's ever been. That's probably not the case, but you can also, you can also track kind of like you're talking about with stocks. You can see when you're in a dip. Um, and it seems that there's a little bit of, a little bit of challenges on the horizon in your mind. Does that change the way we engage these things as Christians? So if you're a, and I, again, I'm, I'm specifically thinking to like, you know, you're, you're Christian, you're in a, you're in a, you know, just small rural church or wherever you, wherever you find yourself, but you're trying to, as best you can engage the culture as a Christian, um, does that does this change things in the way that you go about that? Whereas maybe back in the 1920s, you may have had a you know an easier time walking into a business meeting. Now you walk in and you you know you have your church T-shirt on or something like that, and and people now view that as a negative as as opposed to a net positive. Do you think that changes the conversation, or is it is it somewhat the same? It changes it at some level if you're going to be involved. Involved, if you're going to be employed by like a, a major corporation, you're going to have to be aware of DEI sort of requirements and what you might get in your, what you might be facing down and whether and what sort of posture you want to take towards that. Right. <clears throat> if you're going to uh, get inv involved in military, you know, uh, it's not we can't just raise up another military that could fight international wars. Right. So Christians, as much as I wouldn't want my son to be in the military, I mean, I don't know what we do. Like if Christians get out of the military, it's going to just get worse. But if you go in, look what you're dealing with right now. So I think right. that the evil of the day has we have to be sober about what, where we're going and how people perceive things. And also just there's a lot people don't understand Christianity. Um, they either A, don't understand it or B, they're apostates that hate it. So there's, there's a little, so I, I always tell people, I don't know that we're in a post-Christian society as much as an apostate Christian society. So post like having moved past it, we're apostate, like existing against it, right? Actively against it. So it's like when you talk to one of these people that um, like, it's going to be hard for you to believe this, but I, I wasn't always an atheist. I used to be an evangelical and you're like every outspoken atheist I've ever known was some ex evangelical, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of happening at a cultural level now. Um, so you, you have to be aware of that as you get involved in your local community, um, that some of the terminology you're using is totally foreign from them. I really think that's what's going on with Christian nationalism and a lot of the the language. It's really labels, you know, because if I sit down and explain to people in a few minutes the things that I believe, most of them see at least the rationale and think it's sensible, right? Even if they might disagree. Um, I think people... Uh, have a very associative minds and when they hear words that remind them of things their minds jump there right away mm -hmm. and 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 then they kind of project onto whatever it is that is existing in their mind so if you hear nationalism you think arianism you know whether you should or shouldn't right that's where people's minds go or you use the word like dominion you think domination if you hear domination you might think bdsm right i've heard, had people bring this stuff up i'm like well, I, well I don't talk about that you know well, you right. said dominion. Well, yeah, well, there's a few, you've taken a few jumps, but this is how minds work right now. And so I think understanding how how you need to speak and communicate uh, so people, they, it, they may still reject you, but let's have them reject you because they actually understand what you're saying and not because you're not communicating well. Because we are kind of, it is kind of a Babylon Babylon ish situation right now for the faithful church. We're right. few, we don't have control like we did. And so we have to, you know, Aaron's been writing a lot about being cultural insurgents. We have to think that sort of way. Yeah, no, that's good. So I, I want to land the plane, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking toward just kind of, and this is, this is a tough one. So feel free to tell me if there's a bad question, but I'm, I'm thinking toward just like action steps for the Christian in the pew. So, um, or for the pastor in the pulpit, I mean, I, I guess it doesn't really matter that much, but like for, for your church, if you're looking around and you're saying, look, we're trying to focus on the main things, we're trying to keep word and sacrament central to the church. And yet I'm not sure we're really building any sort of culture. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it really emanates out from, you know, the, the walls of the church house, so to speak. I'm not sure we're having an impact in our community. Um, I know like, you know, I'm a, 
I'm an 80s baby and I, I've heard you talk about the 80s. So maybe you resonate with the like I remember in the 90s, like it was that big mantra of like, you know, if your church was gone from the community and and they don't understand. And I think that can get overplayed. I think some people took that to to a weird way. But um, but in general, I think most of us would say, no, I do want my church to have a, an impact on this community in whatever way God sees fit to work through our church. Um but if you're if you're that guy and you're looking toward just steps, like I, I don't see a whole lot of this. I'm I'm worried that maybe our church isn't impacting our community. I don't want it to become co-opted as some sort of political action committee. But at the same time, I do want to to make some impact. What are some like just basic steps, may, maybe near term or even long term, um, that the Christian can be looking toward toward like I can't affect global change. I cannot replace the World Economic Forum or whatever your conception is, but I can do some things. Where would you direct that guy that's just trying his best where he's at? Sure. Well, I would start, uh, I'll give you three steps. Urge Christians first to co-op existing programs in third places. So get involved in your actual community. Let people know you. A lot of times it's the fear of the unknown. And, um, you know, like guys like me, we have like an online persona. That's like what people think. And then then they meet me and I... I I'm a different guy. I, I'm not a different guy. It's just, it's online. It's like, it, it eliminates part of your, your presence and all that sort of stuff. Right? right. So when people hear ideas, like when you get involved in your community, they actually know you a little bit. So like existing programs, for example, uh, my son is part of the wrestling team at uh, Claremont Northeastern. And it's been a wonderful experience. It's been good for him. Uh, some members of the wrestling team are Christians. Some aren't. A lot of the, the parents um, are Christians, but some, again, aren't. And we get to talk about what's going on with their kids and society. And and uh, it's and I, I don't have time to start a wrestling team. So why not just join something that's existing? So I always tell people you can adopt, adapt, or reject. So there's some things in your community that you can just adopt whole, wholesale. And so that wrestling team is is conducted in such a way that I don't really have to change anything. But there may be some things you have to adapt, right? It's got some parts to it that you, you don't agree with. And then there may be uh, things your community have to reject. And if that's the case, you start something else. But I always like look for ways to uh, co-op the existing programs that, you know, like, for example, we have a, a swim club. So a lot of our women are on the swim club board that oversees the swim club for Batavia and they you know they find out a lot about what's going on in the community and they get involved there uh so third place is is basically uh first place is home second place is work and the third place is the next place you spend the most time at so that's like gyms one advantage of belonging to a gym uh, I have a gym in my my uh one of my outbuildings but I also have a membership at the YMCA down the road here um when I'm sitting there in the hot tub or not hot tub in the, the sauna, I hear all about the things that are going on and get to meet people and talk to them. And so those are third places where you, you start to see people over and over again. So just get involved. They, they're very natural ways to build relationships. And the still number, the number one way people come to faith is someone invites them to church and they hear the yeah. gospel, they hear the word of God preached. Uh, so uh, one of my favorite quotes is Spurgeon says, grace doesn't make us uh, unearthly, uh, though it makes us unworldly, right? So uh, we want to not be the sort of people that evade, but invade, get involved and, uh, and do what we can. So then I would also say urge Christians to start companies in the local community. Uh, there's almost nothing more powerful. You, over time, you, you start to learn that economic power is even more powerful than political power, at least at scale. Um, and so starting companies, uh, or, or joining startups or something there, uh, people are so thankful to when they have a good employer that pays them a livable wage and is sensitive to different, uh, seasons of life and, and whether or not they have a kid sick or whatever. And also it just gets involved in, in culture making in a big way. You know, I'm, I'm very aware of what's going on in my community because when I'm, I'm looking for land for us to buy to put a new facility up, you know, I hear about who's coming in and going out. So it's just a really powerful way to minister to your employees, but also build relationships with local vendors and local government officials. And local government loves, they'll love anyone that brings a job. And and I'll tell you, after a while, like if, you, if you're employing like, 10, 15, 20, 100 people in your community, people are not going to want to upset you. 
Mm -hmm. And so be, start the sort of companies that aren't easily canceled. And the problem with Christians is that they're always getting canceled. And that's why boycotts don't work. When you try to boycott someone, they usually know you're just going to come back. They just got to wait you out because where else are you going to go? Well, become the people that can't be boycotted, right? Like start start there. So I'd say that. Um, and look for what's lacking in your cup. Your, like we have a, um, a coffee house in downtown Batavia. I would really discourage members in my church from starting a coffee shop in downtown Batavia. I, you'd be splitting the customer, but also like if the, if that coffee shop's good and they're, they're serving a good product and it's a good atmosphere, why would we want to come in as a competitor? Well, bring something else, right? Like look how can you add uh, to what's involved uh, or what's needed in your local community. And then um, I would tell you uh, take full advantage of your U.S. citizenship. We as Christians have dual citizenship. We belong to the kingdom of God, but we also uh, are Americans or whatever you are. And the, the proof of that's really simple is that the Apostle Paul, when uh, when he needed to use his Roman citizenship, he absolutely did. And he and he got uh, he protected his own life and, and got to bring the gospel uh, before Nero by using his Roman citizenship, by using his privileges. And there is no reason why we shouldn't use that for the glory of God and and for some level of self-protection as well. And so can you vote? Go vote. Can you, you know, go, let people know in uh, your offices or your local uh, uh, political positions what you're for and what you're against and let them know whether you're going to vote for them. like, be, hey, this is bad. This goes against God's law. You shouldn't be doing this. God won't bless it. Right. And <clears throat> get use all of that. Those are just a few basic things. But join like use your local library, go to your local gyms, uh, start homeschool co-ops or, or go to the local classical, just get involved where you're at. And then a lot of this stuff takes care of itself. You know, I, I my favorite analogy I give people with most things is a bike chain analogy and you're an eighties kid. So you've done this a million times, but the <laughs> chain falls off your bike. Right. And you flip the bike over you put the chain on one of the gears and you put the teeth on uh, or the part of the chain on the other teeth. And as you pull, you start pushing those pedals, it pops the chain back on. Right. You don't need a full plan to get started. You just get it on there and start forward motion and things fall in place. And a lot of the, like people say, how did you get the sheriff or the deputy sheriff or the mayor come? Like they just showed up through relationships. Like it just happened organically through our body and there's nothing wrong with inviting them, but I'm telling you, if you just get involved in your community in these ways and live out your faith publicly, I never hide my faith. Like I don't have two modes, you know, I, I obviously you act in an appropriate way. When I'm meeting with a vendor, I'm going to talk to them about, you know, what our offer and all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to like break out and to evangelize them in the middle of a, of a deal we're making, but if they ask me what's going on, like, yeah, I'm preparing for this conference or my kids have youth group. Today. Like, yeah, just talk openly about the Lord of my life. Right. And, and people are like, that's it. That, that's interesting. I used to go to church a lot and then it's doors up and up. Yep. And, and so like everyone's sitting here, I just imagine their draft board and their plans and all this. Hey, if you, if you know your first step and you take it, you'll be amazed how God just says, all right, here's the next Here's the next, here's the next. And then you're off to the races. That's how you build Christian communities. Yeah, no, that's, that's so, so helpful. And it's so, it's so, it's something you can actually, you know, sink your teeth into, wrap your hands around. We, uh, I, I, th I think though, and I know, I know we've probably got to wrap up due to time, but, um, but what you were just talking about as far as not living two lives, I, I think that that's what handicaps a lot of us as Christians is just, it's not that you have to do anything spectacular, but it's, and maybe it's the whole culture we've built where you go and do visitation or you, you have these times when you do a Christian, not that there's anything wrong with visitation, but like you do a Christian thing and then you go back to doing something different. And like you said, it's not that you have to be sharing the gospel, but um, I, I tell people all the time, like one of my favorite jobs, it was when I was in seminary, I was working on a train. And so you'd get on a train and, you know, you'd be stuck on a train for 12, 14 hours, just driving a, you know, driving a train down the tracks. And I would just ask somebody, you know, the, the person I was working with, like, hey, how's your life? And like everybody's life is terrible, or at least that was my experience. Like everybody had something to complain about. And uh, so, you know, well, my life's terrible. My wife left me. And you just start asking them just like two questions. And all of a sudden you're talking about the Lord really fast. If you just if you just tell them about what's most important to you, it wasn't that difficult. Um, 
But anyway, my, Michael, this has been so so refreshing and so encouraging. Where once again, where can people follow you? And do you have any projects you're working on that you wanted to wanted to throw out there? Or where where can people keep up with you, man? I'm most active, like I said, on Twitter, which is this is Foster, and on Instagram at We Made People. Um, I have my own podcast that I do stuff every once in a while called This Is Foster. I kind of get to it. It's like whenever I feel like it, you know? Uh, um, and then my wife and I will be relaunching We Made People, which is kind of our take. Uh, so a lot of uh, marriage podcasts in the past, like we're awesome. Look how awesome we are. Don't you want to be awesome? And here's like the 10 things that you have to do to be awesome. Like we are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we hate that. We, we wanted to do a podcast where it's like, here's all the ways we screwed up. And here's how we figured things out slowly through our life. So we started doing that with the story. But um, then uh, then my mom died, and so it, the project kind of stalled. So we're relaunching that here um, probably at the end of, uh, of April with the new baby, like we're recording stuff right now. Those are the things I'm working on right now. But really, if you, if you want to back what I'm doing, uh, just move the Batavia and join our church. If not, uh, best luck to you. <laughs> That, that works. Well, Michael, thanks so much, brother. I appreciate you uh, carving out some time and chatting today. Awesome. Seated here at my ride.